The Lord be with you. I got, I got all of you lot. Let's try this lot as well. The Lord be with you. Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel on this beautiful September day. Autumn has arrived, I think. It's wonderful to have you with us this morning as we gather in God's presence to worship God, to give thanks for all the good things we receive, to pray for our world and all manner of other things. And welcome to those who are listening online. Um, it's wonderful that we're able to broadcast online as well, so other folk who can't be in the building can join in with our worship. Um, I'm delighted that Nick's going to be preaching for us later. Uh, we have a, a plethora of singers this morning and musicians to lead us as we worship God together. Uh, but we'll begin with a few notices. There are quite a few this morning. I'll try not to go too fast, but not keep us too long. Could we have the first one, Vicky? First of all, just a quick reminder, because our young people and children's groups are restarting today. These are your collection times. Hopefully you'll know whether your child is a dove, an owl, or an eagle. And you'll hopefully know where to collect your child from. And those are the times to collect them, just so that we can make sure everybody's safely away and back with parents. That's our first one. Second notice. You may know about this, many of you will know about this, some of you won't. We have a wonderful piece of artwork that is underway. Well, the, the artwork, I think, is pretty much completed. I'm looking for Nick. The artwork's completed. The installation is nearly completed. Nick's looking nervous because it's going to be unveiled in this corner next weekend. It's entitled Joy Comes in the Morning. If you want to know more about the story of the artwork, you can go onto our website or the e-news uh, and find out more. But this is it's both a memorial and a celebration of the journey we've been on as a church over 10 years. A memorial to those we have sadly lost along the way and a testament to the journey towards being a fully inclusive church. It will be unveiled on Saturday morning as part of our conference next weekend. And um, I think I'm writing saying it's John Bell has written a beautiful liturgy uh, for the unveiling of this artwork. Um, and on the subject of John Bell, even if you're not coming to our conference on Saturday, on Friday evening, John Bell is going to be coming and sharing um, some wonderful reflection with us, having an interview with uh, Nick, and also we'll have some, uh, some sung worship, which Andy is going to be leading. It starts 7.30 on Friday evening here, and like I say, if you're not coming to the conference, you can still come to that absolutely free. What I'd suggest is... Come before 7.30 to make sure you get a seat uh, and to meet other folk who are coming along too. Uh, while we're on the subject of next weekend, s- next Sunday we have our service... Oh, oh, I'll come to the pet blessing in a minute. So I forgot to do a slide for this one. Next Sunday morning, here, 10.30, our guest preacher will be David Runcorn, who is also speaking at our conference. At St. James, at 11 o'clock, the guest preacher will be John Bell. Um, you can choose which you go to. If you're really cunning, I reckon you can do both. But I probably shouldn't be encouraging that, necessarily. Um, But it's a kind of continuation of the conference around being an inclusive church, but also a wonderful opportunity to hear uh, two guest preachers, or one one or two of them. Now on to our most exciting notice. Can I have a... Put your hand up if you have a pet animal. Fabulous. I, well, I said animal for very specific reasons. But we have a pet blessing service at St. James, 3 p.m., the last Sunday of September. All pets and humans are welcome. The only thing we ask is have a think about your pet, how your pet is going to stay safe, and how you can prevent your pet from eating any other pets. So you might want to bring a carrier or have a lead or whatever you see fit. Uh, It's going to be a wonderful service where we will give thanks to God for the whole creation and bless our pets. So far, I've been almost promised a Komodo dragon, a scorpion, um, a snail, as well as cats, dogs and rabbits. There's no limit on age of pet or human either, so do come along. Just two other notices, I haven't got slides for these, but we have two opportunities to explore what it means to be a Christian seven days a week. 
our Did to Be Disciples is resuming again soon. Patrick, do we have a date yet? <laughs> Becky. Don't worry. Look out for the e-news. We'll have a date for Didsbury Disciples. Didsbury Disciples doesn't mean you have to live in Didsbury to come to it, but it's a way of exploring what it means to be a disciple of Jesus seven days a week, wherever you find yourself on those seven days. More information to follow. If you are thinking, what is this Christianity thing all about, whether you've come to the church for the first time or the hundredth time, and you want to really get into what the Christians believe and do right from the very basics. Lisa, Benja and I are going to be leading a course starting 22nd of October. The information will go out in the e-news and that's a wonderful opportunity where no questions are off the table. You can say who on earth is Jesus and that's okay and we'll seek to answer those questions. I promise this is the last notice. If you would like to donate to our food bank, which I'm hoping many of you do, we now have a blue lidded box just next to where the card reader is over here, where you can donate um, non-perishable goods for our food bank. And I know Chris will be delighted uh, to receive those and then pass them on to our Trust or Trust food bank. Is that everything, Nick? Nick thinks that's everything. But of course, we gather as God's people, young and old and everything in between, to be in God's presence to know God's love. And somebody said something to me this morning. I hope that by the time people leave the service, they will think that Jesus is lovelier than they did when they arrived. And that's my prayer for you today. Uh, But as we begin, I'm going to invite Edward and Peter and Luke. We've got a triple act this morning to come and light our altar candles. these candles to remind us of God's constant presence with us. And let us pray. Amazing and loving God, as we meet together, inspire us by your word. Renew us with your spirit and unite us as we worship you, creator, redeemer and sustainer. Amen. We're going to sing two songs together, one of which may be a little bit newer to some of you. And if it's comfortable to, and if you wish to do so, please stand as we sing together, Come People of the Risen King.
what he said. Next uh, week we've got some uh, uh, conference and we're going to learn a new song which we're going to sing at the conference. So I think perhaps if you sit down, we'll sing the song to you. And then uh, you can pick it up as we, uh, we go along. I love that song. I love that song a lot. And if, if you love it, and if you're starting to love it, we'll get a chance to sing it again next weekend. Our children and young people are going to go out to their groups now, but let's pray for each other as we do so. Please join in with the words on the screen. As you leave us, so we pray. 
Peace be with you on your way. Peace be with you who stay behind. God be in your heart and mind. So children, young people, enjoy your time together. I'm sure we'll enjoy our time here and we'll see you a bit later. not sure which group you're going to, look for somebody in a very brightly coloured blue t-shirt or orange t-shirt and they'll let you know where to go. It's been wonderful to have our children and young people with us through the summer in our services, helping us to explore uh, scripture together. But um, I pray that God's blessing would be with them as they also continue to learn about the love of Jesus for them in their groups. As we remain, let's just hear for a moment a reminder of why we gather here together. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. We come now to the point in our service where we have an opportunity to Lay our hearts open before the God who loves us and offers forgiveness, being honest about where we have failed, about the regrets we have, the sins we've committed against God and especially also against our neighbours. But we're reminded that God so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus Christ to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. We say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate faults. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to worship God together now in a song which I think we have done this summer, but again might be fairly new to some of you. But if it's comfortable to do so, please stand as we sing Holy Forever.
Please do be seated. As a church, oh, I'm just going to check, I'm, am I switched on? I am switched on. As a church, we support a number of different organizations and individuals who are seeking to bring God's love, the message and the good news of Jesus to our world, and also to offer practical assistance to those who are particularly vulnerable in our world. And so each Sunday um, for the last couple of weeks and the next few, we're going to watch a video about one of our mission links Um, And I'm delighted that I get to introduce two of my friends. So in a moment, you're going to see Nem and Eleanor, who are both members of the L'Arche community. The L'Arche community is a community of people with and without disabilities, living, working, playing, worshipping together as God intended. So we're going to watch a little bit about the story of L'Arche, assuming the technology works. Over to you, Vicky. Thank you. Well, this is Eleanor. Yes. And this is Nem. Yeah. And they're both from um, Larsh, Manchester. Yeah, yeah. And can you tell us, Eleanor, where you live? St. Paul's. St. Paul's. Larsh is a, an international organisation, isn't it, that started in France and now is all over the world. And what's the main thing that Larsh does? So we're all about building community between mm-hmm. adults with and without learning disabilities, aren't we? Yeah. So we think that there's something really beautiful that happens when people with learning disabilities and without learning disabilities share life together. Yeah. And in Manchester, that looks like we have houses where people live together. Yeah. So you live with Juliet and your guinea pigs. Yeah. And we also have our, the hive, the day service, where people yeah. come during the day to do yeah. things. Mm-hmm. And we have booty nights. And community gatherings. We have Billy and Andy. Music sessions, yeah. Mm. And then we do, we go on holidays. We recently... Hope Fest. Hope Fest. We've just come back from Hope Fest, which is a festival with the other large communities. In Derbyshire. Yeah, yeah, in Hope Valley. And so, Eleanor, you ran the 10K, didn't you, this year? The Manchester Great Manchester Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. Yeah. How did that go? Really good. Was it really hard work? At the end to them... Them, Sean and Helen uh, couldn't, uh, from Liverpool could not catch me up. <laughs> really? Sprinting at the end and we're all knackered. That's amazing. Yeah, and then you raised a thousand pounds, didn't you? Oh, that's oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, so I think we're we're showing that the world that there's a whole different way of being. Mm. Um, I think it's really similar to the kind of world that Jesus talked about on our good days, <laughs> mm. which is that there is space for everyone mm. and that people are loved for who they are and not mm. what they do. And that actually being different to each other is not a bad thing, that there's something really beautiful about belonging yeah. to people yeah. who, where we're different from each other. Yeah. Um, and we have a lot of fun doing that, don't we? We have a lot of parties and I think Jesus would have liked the parties. Yeah. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Do you like living with Larsh? Yeah. Yeah. Is it funny sometimes? Yeah. I think we are at our happiest when we're celebrating and and enjoying each other's company. Yeah. And I think some of the stuff that can be hard is that um, sometimes finding assistance has been difficult. I think people have been, so they're the people who kind of support the core members, the people with learning disabilities. I think there's 165,000 care workers missing nationally. Wow. So it's a really big problem and we really want to yeah. find the right people. Yeah. It's really important that, they're, that they really understand what we're doing in Lush. Yeah. Um, so that's something people can always pray for is, is, yeah. is finding enough assistance. Yeah. We feel very loved by the community at St. James and Emmanuel and, and that makes us feel like we're not doing it by ourselves because sometimes what we're doing can feel countercultural and a bit yeah. risky and it can yeah. feel a bit lonely so to, to know that people are praying yeah. for us and supporting us feels well, brilliant Eleanor yes is there anything you'd like to say to the people who are watching um, everyone is amazing mm. yeah everyone is amazing yeah just like no <laughs> and just like you yeah if you've been involved with the last community in any way 
We have some wonderful people here. I'm going to put them on the spot. If you want to know more about Larsh, have a chat with those wonderful people um, who've been involved with Larsh. There's one phrase that Eleanor, or oh, that Nem used, which is that people are loved by God not for what they do, but for who they are. So if you take only one thing away, I think that's a wonderful message. And also feel free to chat with me also if you'd like to find out more about Larsh and about how you can support that community. I'd like to invite uh, Fiona forward now, who's going to read to us uh, from Scripture. Thank you. The first reading is taken from the book of James, chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 1. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, And if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but you do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself if it has no works, is dead. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to hear our uh, New Testament reading from Mark's Gospel. First of all, in English, uh, uh, we'll have it, oh no, we'll have it in Farsi first. Yeah, we'll have it in Farsi first. We'll do it the other way around today. A reading from Mark's Gospel and then Trish will share it uh, with us in English. Come on forward. مرقس ایمان زن یهودی ایسا آنجا را ترک گفت و به نواهی سور و سیدون رفت به خانه در آمد اما نمیخواست کسی با خبر شود با این حال نتوانست حضور خود را پنهان دارد زنی که دختر کوچیکش روح پلید داشت چون شنید او آنجاست بیدرنگ آمد و به پاهای او افتاد آن زن که یونانی و از مردمان فینیقی سوریه بود از عیسی تمنا کرد که دیو را از دخترش بیرون کند عیسی به او گفت بگذار نخوص فرزندانت سیر شوند زیرا نان فرزندان را گرفتن و پیش سگان انداختن روا نیست زن پاسخ داد بله سر برم اما سگان نیز در پای سفره از خورده های نان فرزندانم میخورند عیسی به او گفت به خاطر این سخنت برو که دیو از دخترت بیرون آمد آن زن چون به خانه رسید دید که دخترش بر بستر دراز کشیده و دیو از او بیرون شده است. شفای مرد کرولال عیسی از ناحیه سور بازگشت و از 
راه سیدون به سوی دریاچه جلی رفت و از میان قلم رو دکاپولیس عبور میکرد در آنجا مردی را نزد او آوردند که کر بود و هم لطنت زبان داشت از ایسا التماس کردند دست خیش را بر او بنهد ایسان مرد را از میان جماعت بیرون آورده به کناری برد و انگشتان خود را در گوشهای او گذاشت سپس آب دهن انداخت و زبان آن مرد را لمس کرد آنگاه به سوی آسمان نظر کرده آهی عمیق کشید و گفت افته یعنی باز شد در دم گوشهای مرد باز شد و گرفتگی زبانش برطرف گردید و توانست به راحتی سخن گوید اما ایسا آنها را قدغن کرد که این موضوع را به کسی نگویند ولی هرچه بیشتر قدغنشون میکرد بیشتر از این واقع سخن میگفتند مردم با حیرت بسیار میگفتند هرچه او کرده نیکوست حتی کران را شنوا و گنگان را گویا میکنند این از کلام خدا من. The second reading is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, verses 24 to the end. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon had gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre, and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee, in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Eptaptha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the word of the Lord. I'm delighted that Nick's going to come forward and explain what these readings are all about. Um, <clears throat> let's just pray for a moment. Loving God, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you are a healer, that you long for us to all be whole. We pray that through Nick's words and through your Holy Spirit, we may receive every good thing you have for us today. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Mark. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, good morning to people who are listening at home on this. Uh, I think Alison will be, so shout out to Alison. Um, Oh, gosh, it's so weird. I, I haven't preached a, what you might call an adult sermon in weeks because of the summer. Um, and uh, so it's really strange when you stand up and you got to deliver something to a different group like this. I, I, you know I like to give sermons working titles. I don't know if, if the other preachers do that, just to focus thought. So I started off with the humility of God 
and the Expanding Mission of Christ, which I think is a reasonable title for this passage in Mark's Gospel. And then I thought, no, 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 that's not quite refined enough for what I think is going on here. So my second title, and the one that I'm really going to go with, is When a Woman Changed God's Mind, which I think is a really nice uh, title because it gets straight to the point. So women... This is about you today. And I, I cannot emphasize this enough. This is a moment in Scripture between Jesus, the Son of God, God, and a woman which changed the entire course of human history. I kid you not. Hold on to your hats. Women, today is a day to be honored in Scripture. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you have been on holiday this summer. I, great. Most of this church goes in September. <laughs> um, how, did, you, did you see that statistic? I think it was in one of the newspapers that I read recently that 50% of workers check their emails on holiday. Is anyone going to own up to that? Can I just say something? Rachel's in a children's group, right? <laughs> so you're not allowed to say a word. I always check my emails on holiday. And then, this is even worse. Lie about it to Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> this is why we don't want to broadcast things live online. <laughs> um, anyway, she knows. She suspects. But the reason is, I don't know about, about those of you that do, it's kind of like, if I check, then I know what's facing me when I get back. Is that what the rest of you, is that why you do it? Well, but I desperately don't want to. And the reason I did this summer, I was in Denmark, so I was like 500 miles away from home. I could not look at my emails, then a WhatsApp came through. What do you do about WhatsApp? It's the most intrusive holiday-destroying app ever invented. Well, the reason I mention this, I'm, I know what some of you are thinking. Why don't you just delete the app while you're on holiday? Anyway, I didn't. So, I think Jesus has gone on holiday to get away from it all. And the reason I think that, well, that's a, that's a thought anyway, is that normally when we... G Jesus does a lot of travelling in the Bible... But it's always like a yo-yo up and down between Galilee and Jerusalem. Like this, like a yo-yo. Up he goes, down he goes. That's where he is. He's in Jerusalem. Now he's in Galilee. Now he's in Jerusalem. And that's how he tends to go. But this is really unusual. This is, this is unique. He's gone completely the opposite direction. And it's not just a short journey. He's gone 40 miles off to the Mediterranean, to the port city of Tyre. He's gone to the beach. But he's also gone deeply into Gentile territory. He is miles away from home. There is no WhatsApp. There is no emails. He's gone away for some peace and quiet. Oh dear. We'll come back to that in a minute. Poor Jesus. I do think, well, we've had a shout out for women and here's a shout out for introverts because I just have this feel. Jesus spends most of scripture trying to escape from people and never quite manages it. So if that's you, my friends, this passage is also for you today. Because Jesus has gone away 40 miles into Gentile territory to the beach. And even there, he can't escape notice. Jesus, we don't find out who's with Jesus. We can suspect that some of his disciples are with him. And we don't actually know why he went to Tyre. We can just guess. But the story opens with Jesus trying to stay hidden in a house where no one can see him. But what we also know is that the encounter that takes place in this house changes the entire course of history. We would not be here in Emmanuel today if it wasn't for the Syrophoenician woman in this story. The story that opens with a mother who has a desperately sick child. And those of us who've ever cared for a child in any capacity will know 
that you will do almost anything for them. And I say particularly a mother, I'm not sure if I could justify that entirely, but I think particularly a mother who has this sick child. And she believes, for some reason unknown, that this rabbi staying in this house, this Jewish rabbi, might be able to help her. The woman comes to Jesus in a moment of absolute need. She'll stop at nothing. And she falls at his feet. Now, this is such a hard response from Jesus. Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to their dogs. Now, I don't want to over-egg this. I think many, many people get stuck on this one sentence and then miss the significance of the rest of the story. But I think we do need to say at least once that for Jesus to call anybody a dog was offensive. So let's just mark that and come, not necessarily come back to it, but try and understand it within context. Because I think Jesus had gone away to Tyre. This is all my theories, by the way. I'll put it in my new book. But this is, these are my theories. I think Jesus had gone to Tyre, into Gentile country, with the express purpose of testing the extent or boundaries of his ministry. Because what we learn from Jesus himself is where he says, I have come for the lost sheep of Israel. He believed that was his mission. I've come for these people, the lost sheep of Israel. And that's what we've seen all the way through scripture. Now suddenly he's gone into Gentile territory, he's got a Gentile woman in front of him, and he's saying it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. He's testing his own ministry. That's what I believe is going on here. Jesus draws a boundary. His mission to this point is the focus is on the children of God, the lost children of Israel. This woman, this Syrophoenician woman, is outside of the boundary. Have any any of you watched Game of Thrones? No. Some of you have, surely. Yes, some are nodding. This woman in Game of Thrones parlance is north of the wall. She's beyond the limit of civilization. She's somebody to be kept out. But then this is why this is so important. The woman does not give up. Instead, she responds with faith and with wit. She responds with humor to God. Yes, Lord, she says, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She doesn't argue with the boundary that Jesus has set. She's not saying your boundary is wrong. But she believes there's still room in God's mercy for her. She believes, and this is the beautiful thing, that even a crumb, one crumb from the kingdom of God, is enough. And is enough to heal her daughter. And is enough for her. And in this moment, Jesus changes his mind. Think about that for a moment. Jesus, the Son of God, changes his mind because of an encounter with a Gentile woman. It's almost as if her faith opens his eyes to the fullness of the mission that he's been given. And this gives us a profound insight into the character of God himself. God is not distant, not unmovable, not untouchable. 
This is not very St. James and Emmanuel, but we separate the roles in our household into blue jobs and pink jobs. I get it's not at all, it's very binary, it's not St. James and Emmanuel. Guess which jobs I get? The toilets. Okay, and the bins, but the toilets. Okay, and last week, I wasn't even thinking about this story, but last week I was cleaning the upstairs toilet. I'm on my knees and I've got my squirty things and my cloth and it suddenly popped into my mind probably because of what I was doing why is it why is it that in the Bible we are encouraged and I've looked this up subsequently why is it in the Bible that we are encouraged over 50 times to be humble I don't know you might I'm not asking for um for people to fire back an answer. But think, why is it we're asked over 50 times to be humble? Well, I I got an insight into this in this passage. We're asked to be humble because God is humble. And we are to be like him. God is humble, relational, and responsive. What we witness in this story between Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman is the humility of God. Jesus doesn't stand above the woman, issuing commands from a distance. He engages with her, he listens to her, and he is changed by the interaction with her. This challenges any notion that we might have of God simply sitting distantly up there, directing events like a puppet master. Instead, instead what we see is a God who is willing to be in conversation with us, responding to us, even, and I can hardly believe I'm saying this, even learning from us. Think about that for a moment. When God created humanity, he did it because he wanted to have a real relationship, not a fake relationship. That's why we have real relationships with each other. Why would it be any different with God? We interact. We change each other. We form each other. We are in that kind of relationship with God as well. And so in this moment, through this one interaction, the boundary between Jew and Gentile begins to dissolve Jesus recognizes the faith of this outsider and he acts. He heals her daughter and in so doing he extends his mission beyond the children of Israel. In one encounter, in one moment, Jesus' mission has gone from this narrow group of people, the lost sheep of Israel, to suddenly the entire world through one encounter. To use the title of a forthcoming book that will be on the bookstore this Saturday we see the widening of God's mercy. The kingdom of God, Jesus realizes, is not confined to a single people. It's for all who come to God in faith, regardless of their background, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their gender, regardless of their status. And a week ago last Saturday, in this village, crumbs fell from God's table. And you know what? Crumbs are enough. I can live with crumbs. A week ago last Saturday, we did what Jesus did. We enabled the widening of God's mercy. And if those are what the crumbs look like, then they are enough for me. But the story doesn't quite finish there, although it could, because immediately following this encounter, we see Jesus heal a man who is deaf and mute. And while Mark doesn't tell us this explicitly, it's likely from where we know Jesus has gone, that this man too is a Gentile. And here we see Jesus doing something really lovely. He's practicing his new learning. This time, there is no hesitation. No boundary is drawn. Jesus simply takes the man aside, touches him and says, in English, be opened. And the man is healed, probably a Gentile. This progression is important 
First, Jesus is confronted with a boundary. Then, through the encounter with the Syrophoenician woman, that boundary is stretched. And now, with the healing of the deaf and mute man, the boundary has gone entirely. Jesus' mission is expanding before our eyes. And it's a mission that includes everyone. Everyone. Why does the church make this so complicated? Why? What might this be saying to us? First, it shows us a God who is humble and willing to listen. He's not unmoved by your prayers. He's not unmoved by your prayers. He is touched by your prayers. Yes, his love... His justice and his mercy are eternal. But in this passage, we see that God wants to engage with us in a relationship with us. He's not disconnected. He wants a conversation. He hears our cries. He sees our challenges. He's willing to respond. Amazingly, God is not only the teacher but also the learner. And when we begin to see that, we understand why it is that he asks us also to be humble, like he is humble. How we ought to grow in understanding, to have boundaries challenged and broken when we see people in need. He lives and grows through the creation that he made for himself. And secondly, it shows us the inclusivity of God's love. The kingdom of God isn't just for those who were born into it. It's for anyone who seeks God with faith, anyone who recognizes their need for grace. Jesus' encounter with the Syrophoenician woman is a turning point, but not only for him, but for us. Because it reminds us, again, that nobody is beyond the reach of God's love. Nobody ever And finally, it calls us to be open. The word Jesus speaks over the deaf mute is ephaphra, which means be open. And I think he used that word deliberately because he had been opened by a Gentile woman. In the same way, we're called to be open to God, to others, and to the ever-widening scope of God's mission in the world. So as we reflect on this passage, let's take comfort as a community, knowing that we have a God who listens, engages, and who has ever-expanding boundaries of grace. Let's be like the one we worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your ever-widening mercy that has already swept us into your embrace and is traveling beyond us and our church to embrace others with your love. May we be more like you. And I want to pray particularly this morning, Lord, for those who have been excluded, not by you, but maybe by the church, maybe by us. We pray for those in minorities. We pray for women. We pray for those who've been excluded because of their ethnicity, maybe looked down on. We're sorry. We thank you for your grace. With the coming conference this Saturday, we pray that the ever widening love and mercy of God would extend to those in the LGBT community even through us. And we pray that those who come next Saturday would take that love back to their own churches throughout the UK. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are such a wonderful, wonderful God. Thank you for your love. Amen.
Thank you, Nick. I'm going to invite you, if you feel comfortable, to stand to stand with me, and we're going to sing in response to what Nick has shared with us. Strength will rise when we wait upon the Lord. be seated. I'd like to invite uh, Ruth Ford now, who's going to lead us in our prayers of intercession. I don't know how prayer works, but I believe it does. And thank you, Ruth, who's going to lead us in prayer this morning. Radical love. Our prayers this morning centre around the theme, the next weekend's conference. Let us pray. Firstly, we pray for the conference, for those speaking, leading seminars, and for all those attending. We pray that each person may experience firsthand your radical love for them. We pray for Nick, continuing his journey, leading your church to come out and declare and demonstrate that your love is for everyone. We also give thanks for the opportunity to host Didsbury Pride last weekend, and for all those who enjoyed the hospitality in our grounds in the sunshine, and for those who received crumbs of your blessing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We pray for our troubled world, where many need to see Christ walking their streets, showing radical love to change politics, prejudice, and power games. We lift to your love those war-torn cities and countries that see no end to the inhumanity and suffering of people groups. Lord, bring peace and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our own country, where many feel neglected, marginalized, and criticized. Lord, we need to see an expression of your radical love changing lives for better and establishing wise and caring government that will truly be for all people. Thank you for those who make a habit of kindness, charity and gentleness towards their neighbours. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our mission partners. In particular, we pray for L'Arche, thanking you for its inclusive homes in South Manchester, where people live and share together in safe communities. We thank you that they demonstrate love and also that they demonstrate courage in stepping out in faith and obedience. We've been awed this last week or 10 days by the courage of our para-Olympians and respect that same courage shown by those battling similar difficulties. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, we pray for ourselves that we may daily receive and share generously with those we know and meet, maybe the sick, the bereaved, the troubled in mind, and also those who appear to have it all together, the good news of your radical love for them. Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, gathering our prayers and praises into one as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Just a couple of really quick notices about worship. We've, uh, we're delighted we're going to have a large number of our Farsi congregation at 12.30 being confirmed by Bishop Mark. Uh, that means that we will need to get this space ready. So just be aware there may be a bit of furniture moving around you as you're having your teas and coffees. But do also stay for tea and coffee if you'd like to do so. And um, op- is all, I'm always glad of an opportunity to embarrass Nick. Next Sunday, he's not mentioned it, but Nick... Bundok, our rector, is going to be made an honorary canon at Manchester Cathedral, 5.30, is that right, Nick? I think it's 5.30. There won't be an evening service next Sunday to enable those of us who want to, to support and to pray for Nick at the cathedral. Um, Hopefully that will go out in the e-news as well. If you're able, please stand uh, as we will take up our offering uh, towards the work and ministry of this church and also sing together, Bless the Lord, O My Soul.
Peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.